hello everybody. Thank you very much for, for coming along. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about AI as a service, fast track to AI with serverless. Uh, so I'm not going to go deep into training models and all of that kind of stuff. Really what the, the, the takeaway I hope you get from this talk is that uh, adopting machine learning in your day-to-day -day work is really not as difficult as you might think. Um, and that you're, you maybe come away from this talk able to go and start experimenting at low cost with, uh, with, with AI as a service. Because in a lot of cases, uh, the ability to do machine learning or to uh, run inferences is, these days, just an API call away. So for Theorem, we do work in, in the serverless space, uh, obviously, and we work in machine learning. My own particular area of research uh, with regard to machine learning is how do we apply machine learning to the process of software transformation, so decomposing monolithic systems into, micro, into microservices, although, as we, as we heard yesterday, the monolith is not the enemy, um, but can that be treated as a big data problem? Uh, it's a very interesting area, but I'm not going to talk to you about that today. Uh, so this is breakfast. Anyone have breakfast today? Any breakfast fans? Good stuff. Okay. So some sausages, uh, some rashers, black pudding, eggs. So wash it down with some coffee and some orange juice. I tend not to eat breakfast these days, and I tend to avoid this as well. But that's a good traditional Irish or, or English breakfast. So if I want to go to the shops, and I want to buy myself that breakfast, it's going to cost me about 15, 16 pounds to buy these. I'll probably get two breakfasts out of it as well, right? And I can reuse the coffee. But let's say that I wanted to DIY my own breakfast. I wanted to build it from scratch. What does that look like? Well, it looks significantly more expensive, right? I've got to get into animal husbandry. Uh, I need the associated equipment. If I want to do black pudding, I'm going to need to get some oats. I need to grow those oats, maybe a side if I'm not doing it at industrial scale, and a grinder. If I want some eggs, I've got to purchase a hen house. I've got to keep my hens happy while they lay eggs. Get a juicer. Turns out that oranges don't grow so well in the UK, so maybe I've got to pop over to Spain to get my oranges. And for my nice Colombian roast, well, return flights to Bogota are not cheap. So that comes in at a whopping 3,500 compared to my shop-bought breakfast. What's the point of all of that? Well, it's commoditization, right? So my shop-bought breakfast is going to, I certainly get it faster, it's certainly going to be cheaper, and often it's going to be better than what I can do uh, from scratch. And if you've been around this industry long enough, as I have, I'm a little long in the tooth these days, you'll be familiar with commoditization in our industry. So back, back at the turn of the century, it seems strange using that phrase, but back at the turn of the century, we still cared about hardware. We still racked kit. Probably some people still do rack kit, rack kit but it's more of... A, uh, it is becoming a smaller skill, right? We cared about the entire application stack, right away from the hardware through the OS, right up to the client. As we moved through the first decade, virtualization was all the rage. So uh, a lot of that was going on on-premise, uh, maybe in data center as well. But we were managing virtual service, so we'd come up a level of abstraction. As we moved through 2010 through to the first part of the decade, we gave away some of that control and commoditized that part of the stack out to the cloud vendors. So infrastructure as a service became very, very popular. No one really wanted to rack their own kit unless they had specialist applications they needed to do. And so the stack commoditized up. We came up a level of abstraction. And what people are really kind of running at the moment is a lot of container workloads, Kubernetes, and so on. That's commoditizing again. Uh, I don't necessarily want to run my own Kubernetes cluster. I'm more than happy to use a managed service to take away some of that pain for me. As we move on through 2020 and beyond, we're going to see much more co uh, commoditization. So the stack is going to commoditize again, up and up. We're going to go up to a level, another level of abstraction. We just care about running code. We just want to get our functions into production quickly, and we can let someone else take care of all of the, all of the heavy lifting, taking away all that work. Okay. So if you want to get started with machine learning, artificial intelligence, and so on, do you necessarily have to do it yourself, or do you even have the desire to do it yourself? Because there's an awful lot to understand. And I thought Jay's talk uh, this morning was excellent in trying to explain the concepts at, at, at a kind of easy level. But when you get into the detail, there's an awful lot to learn. And my suggestion to you is don't be like poor old Webster here. Don't blow your cerebral cortex if there's an easier way to do this. 
And turns out there is, which is why uh, we've just written this book. It's called AI as a Service. So just in the same way that the rest of the stack is commoditizing out, AI and machine learning is commoditizing as well. And what we wanted to do was to share some of our experience of, of building these types of systems to other developers. So this is really kind of an engineer's guide of how you get uh, on board with uh, commoditized AI services. Uh, it's 40% discount code there, and I've got some free copies if anyone would like one. Come see me afterwards, please. So it's just code. It's just code, and it's only an API call away. And that's the key message I'd like you to take from this talk. And pick your poison, uh, AWS, Google, or Azure. Sorry if your cloud isn't on here. I know there are other clouds. These are the three uh, major vendors, obviously. Um, and you can pick your language as well. Because at the end of the day, generally what you're able to do is just call APIs. So Python, C Sharp, Java, JavaScript, um, whatever language you like. You don't necessarily have to learn Python to be effective with machine learning uh, services. The examples I'm going to give will be using AWS. Uh, for no other reason than AWS is the market leader. Uh, I'm pretty cloud neutral myself. Uh, and JavaScript, uh, purely because JavaScript is my favorite language at the moment, uh, although I'm kind of fond of Python as well. So what are some of the forces behind this commoditization? And most people here are probably fairly familiar with this. So we've obviously growth of compute power is continuing exponentially. We're still seeing Moore's law apply. Uh, availability of data is another huge thing that's driven, uh, driven machine learning and the power of machine learning and improved model building techniques. If you couple that with the uh, business pressure to reduce release cycles, to shorten iteration times and scale down the unit of deployment so that we can get features into production quicker, that leads to two things. If you couple that with cloud economics, it leads to commoditized AI and the rise of serverless. And I think those are two forces that we should all be paying a lot of attention to in our careers going forward. So the consequences. Uh, I think the consequences are that serverless will increase um, and will become a standard approach for enterprise development. Moving to full utility computing through increased commoditization. And increasingly, we're going to see more and more AI and machine learning services. The range and capability of those is going to grow. And increasingly, as developers, we'll be incorporating those into the business systems and business solutions that we build uh, for our clients or for our internal clients. And it was good to hear Newton referenced earlier today. Uh, one of my favorite quotes by Newton is, of course, is that we stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, so my suggestion is that we stand on the shoulders of these giants in order to rapidly build systems and solutions. So some evidence behind that. Uh, I, I did this uh, survey a couple of times uh, recently in December 2019. Uh, didn't get a chance to update it for this talk, unfortunately. But it's pr it, this is almost certainly out of date. I haven't checked. Uh, that's, that's the pace of innovation here. So if you look across the three major vendors, they all have uh, a huge range of services available, consumed through API. These are serverless services. Uh, compute, data and storage, network, developer support, and of course AI and machine learning. You'll see of course that the green numbers there is the increase over 2018. Now, of course Microsoft is the leader there because the, the marketing machine is, uh, is ever present. So some of, the, some of the services here are a little bit wafer thin, but there's real innovation and a bit of an arms race going on that we can take advantage of. If we dig in to the AI and machine learning set, you'll see that all of the vendors provide a similar range of services. So uh, AWS, Google, and Azure, across image recognition, recommender systems, speech-to-text, text-to-speech, chatbot, um, predictive analytics, language, uh, and NLP, support for training your own models, um, custom search, and then developer support services. So pick your poison. Uh, they'll all do uh, similar things for you. So when should you use this? So, how many, how many people here train their own models and data scientists? And, or to, okay. Okay, good. Not, not so many. Um, some people, when first when they see this, say, well, actually, you know, I can do better. And maybe you can in, in certain instances. But for co solve problems, commoditize problems that are fairly well known, you're probably not going to do better than what the large vendors can do. 
right? Because they have large teams of people that are building these services uh, and time to collect data and time to train all of these models. So when the problem is kind of commodity, it's well understood, then we should be looking to adapt uh, and combine and consume these services to solve our problems. We can also cross-train some of these services for our own particular domain, and I'll have an example of that uh, in a minute. Where the problem is not well understood, of course, uh, so for example, in Susan's talk where she had some very specific needs and, and the data was shaped in such a specific way that you probably couldn't have used the commodity service of that, then you need to go back and start applying tools like TensorFlow, Python, and so on to build uh, custom models for your solution. But look at the commoditized uh, solutions first. But of course, building a model is only a small part of building a system. You may have got your data, trained your model, and it's working, and so on, but those are kind of bits lying around on a, on a lab desk almost. You've still got to host it somewhere. You've still got to get data in and results out. Presumably, you're going to want some form of user interface on it. You've got to worry about scaling, security, uh, monitoring, and, and optimizing performance. So just doing machine learning is a small part of the overall delivery of an ML system. And of course, you want to deploy updates. So in the similar way that we want CI, CD pipelines for our software components that we build, you need some form of pipeline to push uh, updates to your model as you uh, iteratively and continue to improve it. And that can all be uh, done through um, serverless and AI services. OK. So when we were writing the book, we wanted to put down some form of architectural context that most developers uh, would, would kind of understand uh, to kind of bring it close to, to what most people work on uh, in, in kind of a web development environment. Uh, so this is our take on it. So at the top, uh, we have a web application tier. So tools like CloudFront for content delivery, um, API gateway, and some form of firewalling. Uh, a layer of synchronous and then asynchronous services. So by synchronous service, I mean responding typically over HTTP to calls that are made in through the, uh, the API gateway. Asynchronous is usually something like a, a message passing, some form of message bus, uh, maybe Kafka, uh, maybe EventBridge, uh, or, or another bus. And there's been some great talks on, uh, on streaming at this conference as well. Underpinning that, then, are our AI services that we can call to generate business results. And of course, under that, we've got some, we need some data store. And again, uh, in the systems we build, we tend to use serverless databases, so Dynamo, Aurora, or S3. We also need development support services, things like CloudFormation, code pipeline. So we want to apply infrastructure as code paradigms to all of this. And those tools allow us to do that and also allow us to use the services to build CI, CD pipelines. And of course, we need to monitor it. Uh, we need uh, things like CloudWatch and CloudTrails to monitor and alert, or what the, uh, what the cool kids call observability these days. So that's fine. And as we were writing the book, we kind of set ourselves a challenge, um, which was, could we build a cat detector system in a day? Because after all, cat detector systems are really the, uh, the hello world of AI. So can we take all this technology and in a day, a fairly long day, build a cat detector system? By the way, um, I'm a big fan of JavaScript, but I figured I had to get some Python in this talk somewhere. I'm here all week. So yes, turns out you can build it in a day. Um, so again, API gateway at the top. Uh, this is the user interface for it here. Um, we pass in a URL. That gets kicked off to a work queue, into a crawler service, which goes and harvests the images from the site. Uh, and then enqueues each of those images for analysis, uh, calls our AI service, which is uh, recognition, it's an image recognition service in this case, and returns a bunch of results that we can render on the front end. So uh, let me swipe over here, and I can show you this running. So this is just a little example site with some images on it. Um, and this is our cat detector system. So I put a couple of searches in here. So this is the response from just that simple site. There we go. Network's a little flaky. Uh, so word cloud and, and word density, OK? Um, some of my friends who are big into uh, image, uh, image recognition systems tell me that giraffes are actually uh, can often fool models. So I did a Google search for giraffes. And sure enough, it's actually able to identify giraffes, which is good. 
Probably because the people that build these services know that giraffes are difficult and therefore they'll make sure they train for, for giraffes. So we're able to leverage their skills and expertise uh, through calling these services. Anybody want to kick out a search term and we'll see how it does? Anyone want to suggest something? Pineapples. Okay, pineapples. Okay, so copy that. And it's just going to run an analysis, so it shouldn't take a very long. So it's just downloaded, so it's just running the analysis now. Okay, it's analyzed. Let's see how we do. Pineapple, plant, fruit, food. Okay, so not too bad. Um, the other one I tried earlier was, uh, was Terminator, of course. And let me throw that in there. And analyze that again. I'll take a second. Okay, we've analyzed that. And there we go. So we've got human person apparel clothing. Seems reasonable. What seems unreasonable to me is that this is a piece of sculpture, apparently, and not a killer robot. I wonder what they're hiding. Of course, there's a reason for that, and we'll come to that later. Um, OK, so what else can you do? So, so if we just move over to my Jupyter Lab here. So uh, ma many of you might be familiar with Jupyter Notebooks. So this is Jupyter Lab using an iJavaScript extension, because I kind of like JavaScript. So I can, I can build my notebook uh, in a similar way as I can just writing Python. Right? Just if I just prefer JavaScript. So I've, I pushed some images up onto an S3 bucket. So I can just run this piece of code here. And this will show me my images. So first off, the cat detection system you just saw uh, uses a system called a service called recognition. And at the core of that, it's really as simple as a single API call. So I create an instance of uh, recognition here. Um, I point it at, uh, at the image that I want to run the detection on, and I call detect labels. It's as simple as that. It's something that most software developers do on a day-to-day -day basis, is, is consume APIs. Uh, if I run that, you'll see that we get a response back. Um, so I've told it that I only want uh, 10 labels, and I only want anything with a confidence level of over 80. So the response I get back is cat, mammal, animal. And you'll see that I also get a confidence level. So it's important when you're consuming these services that you look at the confidence levels coming out and determine whether that confidence level is enough to allow you to, to, to use the result, or whether you need to kick it out to a human. In this case, 92% is, is a fairly high confidence. So what else can we do off the shelf with this service? Right? So here's a bunch of very, very happy looking people at, a, at an office meeting. Um, so detecting faces is a commodity service now. Right? So again, feed the image in, call detect faces, and then a little bit of code to draw some boxes, and off we go. Here we go. Uh, it gives me some rectangles, confidence levels, and I can box those faces, right? Celebrity de detection is an off-the-shelf service. Who knew? When I first looked at this, I thought, why, why, why would that be important? But I guess for, for news organizations, it's not just celebrities, right? It's people who are newsworthy. Can we detect them in this, this image, right? So here's me. Um, hanging out with my celebrity buddies, uh, the, of whom I have none, I'm afraid, uh, in a recent Oscar ceremony. So we're going to kick this into the, um, the Recognized Celebrities API. Again, this is off the shelf, uh, one call. Uh, kick that through and some boxing. And the response we get is it's identified Daniel Day-Lewis, Marion Coltard, Tilda Swinton. Unfortunately, not the, not the nice bold chap at the end. I have to try harder, I'm afraid. So, in just the way, same way that we can do string searching, we can now do face search, searching as a commodity. So here's, uh, here's Jean-Luc Picard. Um, I kind of agree with him here, actually, I think. I do think Kirk was a better captain. Not a better actor, but it was the crass acting that actually made it worth watching. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this image here, and we're going to see, uh, just calling a commodity API, can we detect uh, Jean-Luc in, uh, in this picture here? So let's kick that off. And have a little think. Okay. 
And you should be able to see there that it's, uh, it's found him and we've drawn a box around his face. Right? So face search as a commodity in the same way as you can do string searches. It's a lot, a lot of power, right? Um, customization. So training uh, a model takes a lot, of, a lot of work and effort. It also takes a lot of infrastructure. Using AI as a service, we can have that infrastructure provided for us and kick off our training with an API call. So uh, this is an example of how you would do that. Uh, I call this single API recognition create project version, passing it a, a test data set and a training data set. Of course, your problem now lies in getting the data set and labeling it, but that's always a problem. But if at least if I can have my infrastructure provided for me, I can do this with very little effort. And then it's just a simple case of call, calling the custom model. Of course, with cloud services, you need to be aware of the costs. So image recognition is 0.1 of a cent to, uh, to run one Im image recognition. Uh, one dollar for hour, per hour of training and four dollars uh, per custom uh, inference hour. Sounds cheap. It's fairly cheap. The problem is when you start to do this at scale, the costs can mount up. So always keep an eye on your, on your cost base. Uh, we had a case recently of one client that left a large compute cluster, a large training compute cluster up over the weekend and came back in on uh, Monday morning with a bill for $6,000. So um, keep an eye on the costs is the lesson there, right? OK. So that's a cat detector. And that's fine, right? Because we're, we're challenging ourselves to build a hello world system, and it's all nice and greenfield, and there's no legacy or anything. But of course, the real world is a, a bit messy. In fact, it's very messy. I'm sure most people in this room have to deal with technology estates that look a bit like this, with ETL jobs flying all over the place, and lots of different databases, and no source of truth, and so on. So how do you start to apply these machine learning uh, algorithms and techniques to the real world? So, as, in, as with all good computer science problems, we just introduce another level of abstraction. So if we treat our, uh, our, our technology estate, or our legacy estate as a, as a black box, we can just bridge in to our cloud system, send the appropriate data over, um, and get a response back uh, through an API. So if, if, it's a, if the process is fast enough, like it's a quick image recognition or extracting some text and can be done quickly, request and response pattern is fine. If it takes a little bit longer to run, then an async, you might consider an asynchronous pattern. So in this case, we're, we're making a call to our API, but we're not expecting any responses back. How do we get the data back out? Well, maybe we we'll build another line of business system, uh, put another client on that can be integrated into our workflow. Maybe we call out to external APIs or some other asynchronous communication mechanism, maybe Slack, maybe email. And, and a third approach, of course, is to, is to do a much tighter uh, integration using streaming. Um, so I'm a big fan of Kafka, uh, use, you, putting a Kafka cluster maybe on premise and then streaming up to a managed Kafka service to uh, put data back and forth. But there are options uh, by abstracting this out and, and treating this as a clean build. So for, for a second example in the book, we wanted to take um, a much kind of larger piece of functionality and see if we could put that together in a few days using commodity AI services. So we took the domain of social CRM. Uh, so this was an area where a lot of money was spent in this, a lot of money invested this, uh, to do kind of brand monitoring and brand control across various social channels. Uh, and four or five years ago, when people were building these systems, it cost a lot of money to do, and a lot of hardware to do as well. So can you do that off the shelf? So let's say we have uh, a company, we've got multiple product departments operating in multiple territories. Um, how are we going to triage that and figure out that we've got some some uh, review data or something that is negative, and which department should we be sending it to? So we need to detect the language, first of all. We maybe want to translate, translate that into English. We want to run some kind of sentiment detection. And incidentally, this type of data is, is quite amenable to uh, off-the-shelf sentiment detection. And then we want to figure out which department we should send it to and then route it onwards. So is it possible to build that off-the-shelf um, fairly quickly? And it is. It looks a bit like this. Uh, so on this end, we've got our various input channels, so maybe Facebook, Twitter, web forms, email, pushing into our API gateway. Uh, that then goes in through a Kinesis stream, and then we call detect language. Uh, we then translate, forward, forward through another stream, run our sentiment detection, and then run our classification. Uh, and out, in this case, we're just outputting to a data bucket. So let me just show you that working. 
so this is our pipeline, and this is using a service called Comprehend, which is a, uh, an NLP service from AWS. So calling the, uh, calling the language detection, again, is a single API call, detect language. That will figure out the dominant language and return me a language code. Um, doing translation, again, is a single API call. Um, so I'm going to, just going to call a, a service called Translate, um, tell it to translate text, giving it the detected language code and the target that I want, uh, I want to translate to. Sentiment analysis, again, is a single API call. But you need to figure out how you process the results, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, this is a case for classification where we actually cross-trained uh, this service, Comprehend, onto a specific domain because the, the document classification that came out of the box wasn't quite there. So in order to do that, uh, what we did is we said, let's take some data, let's take some open data from Stanford, a lot of huge uh, open source data, data sets there, um, and let's look at uh, the Amazon uh, review product graph, and we have uh, of a, over a few dimensions, so automotive, beauty, office, and pet. So we downloaded about half a million records, uh, and that comes in JSON-L format, uh, split that into test and training, uh, convert to CSV, push it up to training bucket, and then call an API to train. And that takes about two hours to run your training, and you're, and you're done. You now have a custom classifier. Ooh. Um, so it's as simple as that API call to run your training. And then to execute, you just call classify document. Now, of course, the problem is getting the right data, labeling the data, and making sure you have accuracies and, and, and eliminating bias. But the point I'm, I'm trying to make here is, of course, that this infrastructure is there, and you can take advantage of it to experiment very rapidly and at fairly low cost. So uh, what we're going to do now is I'm going to pump some data from, through the pipeline. So uh, again, this, uh, this, this is just the HTTP API up here. It's sitting up on AWS. And uh, I have a little bit of code here, which is just going to look at our test data set, pick out some random, uh, random uh, reviewed uh, data, and post it up to that API. Uh, so we'll kick about 10 of those up there. So we'll do that now. OK, so you see there's office, negative, positive, beauty, positive, negative, blah, blah, blah. We'll kick another bunch up as well. OK, there we go. Uh, so let's have a look at, look at how it's done. So uh, at the end result of piping all of that through our streams, it's ended up in, in data buckets. And each, each bucket is keyed on auto or, um, or beauty or whatever the, the classification is. So let me. Oh. So you can see there that we've got some categorizations. And we've also got some unclassified as well. So let's have a quick look at how we interpret these results. Um, so let me print that classification there. So what I'm going to do now, this, this piece of code is just going to pull that back and, and render it in so we can see how it's done. So that looks fairly automotive. But notice that the sentiment there is positive. So I'll explain why it's positive there in a moment. Um, that looks like beauty. Yeah, that looks fairly good. Yeah. And again, we've got a positive there. Uh, and some unclassified as, as well. So this is a case where the classifier looked at it and couldn't figure out which, 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 uh, which department to put it into. So a note on handling results. When you make a call to uh, this API to detect sentiment, you're going to get this JSON back, or very similar to this. It's going to come back with an overall sentiment indicator, so negative, positive, neutral, or mixed. And then it's going to come back with a scoring, uh, a confidence level for each of those. So in this case, the way we're handling that is to say, well, if it's neutral or mixed or negative, then we're going to treat it as negative, right? We're going to err on the side of caution. Um, if it's positive, but the confidence level is less than 85%, we're just going to put it in the negative bucket as well, OK? Uh, and of course, if you can't get a classification score, if your classification uh, level is less than 95%, we've just said leave it as unclassified. So the point of this is what you're able to do now is to handle the bulk of the workload uh, through these automated techniques and then have a human in the loop for the cases where you can't, uh, you can't cope with those. So some other things that you can do uh, with Comprehend. Uh, entity detection, we heard earlier about entity detection. Um, so this is a piece from the BBC recently on uh, Virgin Galactic. 
And I'm just going to run this through uh, entity detection. So let's kick that through there. So it's figured out the entities in this block of text are Virgin Galactic, uh, SpaceX. We've got Richard Branson as a person in there. Um, some quantities, so some, some numeric quantities there, some dates and locations. And of course, that type of processing is very valuable when you want to kind of figure out what this document is about quickly. Uh, news organizations want to get summaries of, of text that's going through. That's available as a commodity. And I'm sure maybe some of you can figure out how that might, might be appropriate to, to where you work. And again, another API is uh, key phrase detection. So this is another article here. In this case, it's on the Mars rover. So we'll just kick that through. And we can see that we've got things bump Mars. It's, so, it's actually on Mars quakes, isn't it? It's about the Mars rover detecting Mars quakes. Okay. Again, costs. Costs are fairly reasonable. Um, fractions of a cent for sentiment detection, um, language detection, and key phrase detection. Uh, costs about 15 US dollars for each million characters in language translation. Um, about $3, $3 per training hour. So again, just beware because these costs look very, very low. But once you start to do it at scale, they start to rack up. So, so always bear that in mind. OK, so I'm going to close now with a few, uh, a few real world examples. Um, so this is a project that we, uh, we worked on back in 2017, way back in 2017, when the world was much, much different. Uh, how do you automatically process bills uh, and extract the information from them. Well, back then, we had to build, uh, build this ourselves. So using an open source optical OCR library, that gives you a, a block line and word structure. Uh, do some maths to figure out the boxes, given that you've got the, the coordinates of the, of the text. And then feed that text through, through your own custom classifiers to say, well, this looks like a name, this looks like an address. And so we've now automatically extracted that information from the form. Roll forward two years, and this has been commoditized out. So what we built in four or five weeks, I guess, can be built in a day, because it's all been commoditized into a service. So Textrax, Form Recognizer, or Google Cloud Vision OCR will do exactly that job uh, without, without us needing to, to charge clients a lot of money to do it. So here's an example of that uh, using Textract. So what I've got here is. Uh, some uh, passport images that I've uploaded onto S3. And obviously, it's a fake passport. And I'm just going to kick that through uh, Textract Analyze Document API and telling it that I want it to treat it as a form. So we'll just run that now. And we'll see that, again, it's come back. It's a similar pattern every time, right? You've got your data and a confidence level. So pretty confident that we've got a passport number at 99%. Not so confident that we've got, in fact, the surname is correct, but not so confident, only a 75% confidence level on that. So again, maybe you, you, you might need to bring a human in the loop depending on what those confidence levels are. But this automated processing certainly would replace what we did uh, a couple of years ago. So just increase commoditization. OK, another example is uh, room rate pricing. So we work with some, some guys that actually do um, price optimization using people. So people with tacit knowledge, they know the industry, um, and they tend to use things like uh, historical room rates, historical occupancy levels. Is it, what's the weather like? Are there any local events on? You know, like is there a, is there a big concert on in town this, uh, this week? Um, and that's fine, but it's very human intensive. Now using a, a service called Forecast from AWS, we can actually start to uh, automate that process. So we can feed in these different types of data, do some cross-training uh, in Forecast, to, to, to apply it to our specific domain, and then push back rate, uh, rate recommendations into the system. So again, that's removing a lot, of, uh, a lot of kind of slow, laborious human work and replacing it with automation. Um, and obviously, the, the, the key reason for doing that is it allows, uh, it allows the company to scale up. Right? They don't have to bring so many people in and train them up. They can automate this and scale. OK, third example is in the agritech space. Um, so this is a case of taking a custom model that this, these guys had trained, uh, very, very smart chaps. And they trained this model to help farmers with nitrate, uh, nitrate spreading. So when is the optimal time to spread fertilizer on a field? Right, Because there are very strict EU regulations. Well, 
I know you guys don't have that. I live in Ireland, right? So we still have the EU. I know you guys don't. So sorry. Okay, touchy subject. Um, we, uh, but there are strict regulations on when you can spread nitrates. And obviously, you want to optimize this for, for, for your, your best result, right? So these guys place a sensor in the field, literally in a muddy field with grass in it. Uh, and it takes nitrate levels, temperature, rainfall, and so on. It also takes images. That then gets fed up to, again, serverless commoditized IoT uh, services um, stored and then fed through their, uh, their deep learning models, which are running on SageMaker. So again, custom trained models, but using this serverless infrastructure to scale and run the solution. Um, we're able to take a prototype uh, from bits on the bench to production in two weeks. And we're continuously, obviously, helping to update and, and, and drive the system forward. And you get the benefits of scaling and all of these kinds of stuff. So again, standing on the shoulders of giants. So uh, in summary, um, I believe that serverless computing will become, increasingly become a standard enterprise development tool and incorporating lots of AI components. And developers will increasingly consume and combine these components to produce business results rapidly without necessarily needing a PhD in machine learning to be effective. AI is not just about the model. You've got to operationalize it. And I believe the, the fastest, most economic route to do that is through serverless technologies. Um, I think I mentioned the book. Uh, happy to take any questions. Uh, so usually a business problem is, is not, doesn't exactly match the APIs. Sure. Um, so how do I go, if I don't know any of the stuff, any of the background, I don't have any of the background knowledge on machine learning, I'm just an ordinary dev. Yep. Where do I get started if, if I still have to customize or, or do some training myself? How do I do that? So I, I'd say the, the way to start, uh, so, so one of the key things here is you can actually start to experiment at very low cost. Right? So if you're, if you're just running at a small scale, experimenting with these services doesn't cost an awful lot. Right? So you can start to get to feel, a feel for how these services work, how they interact, and how they might align with your problem domain. Right? Um, if you want to start doing cross-training, have a look at some of the public data sets and just try out, experiment. Right? If it's only going to cost you a few dollars to do some training... Not 6000 well, six out there, but that was a mistake, right? Yeah, yeah. Be, be, keep an eye on the cost, right? But you can do fairly low cost experimentation here, and that might st start to help bootstrap you up in, into, into how you can consume and combine the services. Questions? Hi, um, thanks for your talk. Um, so you, a lot of the examples you talk about come from sort of deep learning based models, but a lot of the models that uh, can be applied in business are more traditional neural nets. Mm -hmm. um, and in those cases, um, do you think the commodities still make sense or do you think say compile, compiling your trained model from your neural net into some target language and then just chucking that into a Lambda function makes more sense, or would you just go straight to the commodity? Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to give you a disappointing answer, which is it depends, right? <laughs> um, sorry about that. Uh, I, I would generally start on the side of trying to, if I can fit a commodity solution to my problem, I would start there. Um, if, if, it's, if it doesn't quite fit, if I can maybe adapt it with some, some transfer learning, then I would, I would go there. The third step would be actually to do custom training. Um, and, but then I will be starting to, to use some of the tools that are available. Um, all three providers have a great suite of tools to help you with training. Um, so that would be probably in that order, one, two, three, if that makes sense. More questions? Question from me. In your experimentation, did you come across any of these services that you felt aren't really commoditized yet or felt half-baked? Uh, fair question, right? <laughs> um, 
To date, not, not really. Um, that's not to say that I, I, we wouldn't. I know there's been some recent releases uh, from AWS. So, for example, fraud detection is a new service that's gone out. I haven't tried that. Um, one would imagine that it would be at a, at a reasonable enough level. Um, but I, I guess that's, that's both a, it's a curse in the sense that if you're, always adopt, if you're adopting kind of version one of any technology, it's never going to be perfect. But one of the, one of the other benefits, of course, is that if I'm, if I'm consuming a service under the hood, that's going to be constantly improved. So I, I get the benefit of those constant improvements under the hood without needing to do anything. Right? So for me, that's a, that's a real selling point. If it's not perfect, it doesn't fit right now. Do I go off and like, invest an enormous amount of money in training my own solutions, or do I just wait for version 1.1 to come along sure. and solve the problem for me? Right? So it's just another way of thinking about, about the problem, right? Fair, fair. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Thanks, guys.